I uh, was raised in a single family home. My mother raised five of us. And she struggled, and we watch her struggle to m have multiple jobs while she's trying to put five kids through school. But the one thing that she really, really did press home was important was education. And the background that I come from, an urban city, very, very, um, very, um, what's the word I want to use here? Low income. And she says, the only way you're going to get out of this environment is that you have an education. So for me, that meant going beyond high school to college. Uh, I'm first born in my family, and so that was also an, uh, a positive you know, factor as well. And what's interesting, in watching my mom struggle the way she did, she eventually worked herself from being a housekeeper. Uh, she was a housekeeper for a very prominent family in Chicago to actually sit, taking herself back to school when I entered my first year in college, she went back to school and she ended up graduating and getting her teacher's degree. So it became uh, uh, kind of not just the reason why I went, but the reason why I wanted to continue and go as far as I did. My mom was the biggest inspiration. When you see somebody struggle like I watched her do, and then her philosophy, like I said, was the only way you can get past the struggle and that you don't have to do what I had to do is to, to be educated. Then it's like that's an inspiration in and of itself. To watch her go back from cleaning people's floors to going through learning beauty school like she did and then finally becoming a first grade teacher herself, that in and of itself was very inspiring. What it did inspire me also was that I said, I want to teach, but I don't want to teach little kids. And I used to tag on with my mom when she took the kids to, on field trips and all. And um, kids are cute, but when they get into trouble in the zoo and want to climb over the bear cage and that kind of thing, <laughs> that can get a little bit alarming. And I said, I don't want to have to do that kind of teaching. So early on, I knew I wanted to teach. When my mom would come from the doctor's office with my brother, the person, and it was not just one individual, several, that always helped her understand and come home with less anxious about his health care was a pharmacist. And it was amazing because I can remember being a um, very young age and the counter was back there and I think, wow, what's going on back there? And it would look like he or she was putting things into, you know, into different containers and shaking and mixing and that was exciting to me. I had grown up with chemistry sets. So I thought, hmm, I'm mixing things, and I had never thought about pharmacy. And so what happened in high school was a high school guidance counselor said, you know, you don't want to be a doctor, you want to do something in science, you want to do something that helps people, why not think of pharmacy? And if it hadn't been for that person saying, hey, there's a, a weekend where you can go and just take a look at it at Purdue University, which was a state land grant public institution, uh, that might give you a chance to see what you, to, to test it and see if you're interested in it. So I went down to Purdue for a weekend that would have been in probably in 72. And uh, that particular weekend, another individual, his name is Dick Weaver, kind of a second level of inspiration. And this guy took an interest in especially all the black students. And he says, hey, I have this summer program. Those of you who are graduating soon, if you fit, you want to come back to this program, if you apply then you can test it out and see what it's like taking college level courses. The first year it was like um, family, when you don't have anybody else who's gone to college, they think it's kind of like going to high school, you know, you, come, you can come back and forth. And I think I thought that for a while as well. And it was, and that, you know, you want to be in touch with the family, you don't want to lose con connection with them. But yet, at some point, I've got to be able to say, hey, I need to focus on what's happening here at the university, and especially with my studies. So for the family, I think those, that first few months was a really tough one for them getting used to, I can't run back and forth, and it was tough on me as well. After the first year, and in pharmacy, you go pre-pharmacy, and then you're admitted to the, you know, to the college. Um, that first semester, I went home for Christmas break. And that was when I said, I can't do it anymore, guys. I can't keep running back and forth. You can't keep calling me to help me, help me, you know, get me to help you solve little problems when I'm not there, getting me to run interference between things. I really need to stay, stay at, you know, at Purdue and focus on coursework. And that was tough. It was tough for them, it was tough for me. Because, you know, on the one hand, you want to stay connected, and on the other, uh, I needed to be focused. But my mom helped, because mom kind of stepped in and she said, hey, 
we will just contact you when there's emergencies, when we, need, when, when we really need you, and I plan on just coming home maybe once a month instead of trying to do that every week. It helped my grades <laughs> because that was one of the things, it was very frustrating at Purdue at first, and that was one of the, the, I would say, obstacles I had to get over. I was a top scholar in my high school and had always been in, in, in when I was in Gary. And then I got to Purdue and took courses like you know, the math, the chemistry, physics, all of these things hitting you at one time, and everybody there in the class were, had been tops in their classes. But they had also gone to college prep, univer, uh, college prep high schools that had totally prepared them, and I didn't realize that I was not as prepared. The finances. That was a major adversity in my life. As I had mentioned, you know, my mom's a single mom and she could, was not gonna be able to afford to send me to school. So there were loans that I needed to get. Uh, I got grants, you know, there were a few scholarships, but of course there's never enough, you know, when you're trying to pay for a room and board, you're needing to pay for books, uh, you have the, the, the tuition to pay. And what's interesting is when you're a first generation graduate uh, at a college, you don't know that books are not part of tuition. You don't realize that housing is not part of it. I think today we try to make things like that a lot clearer for incoming students. But even if that's the case, you still have to have money for incidentals. So financial was a, was a big concern. I was constantly worried about when I leave here, what kind of loans would I have? How would I be able to manage that? You know, how would I be able to handle it? Um, and then if, even though I didn't have, you know, I, I left with a large loan debt, but at the time I had no clue that a program, my graduating, you know, program could help me, you know, my, I'm sorry, my job could help me pay that off. Being at a university that was very similar to University of Kentucky in the early 70s it was very difficult because you had this racial, the, the, the racial, um, obstacles were not just from, from, from whites, but it was pe even from people of your own race, okay? So you had blacks who weren't sure if they wanted to go into this militant. I mentioned Angela Davis. That was very, very popular at that time. People were not sure if they wanted to be, you know, this totally, you know, to the militant side and anger all the time, or if they wanted to be passive. Um, given my skin complexion, I was kind of caught in between two worlds as, as well, because I would be in some circles of black friends and they didn't want to accept me because they're like, well, you look like you can pass. And, you know, and I was like, I'm not trying to pass for anything except for who I am. And then I'm over here in, in, in circles with white students and they were coming from rural areas in the state where they, like I said, had never seen a black person. For, so for them, it was like, I don't know if I can, you know, trust this person or even feel comfortable with this individual. In pharmacy school, one of the things you learn is that people, the, the professors, I guess they think you're kind of like this big sponge. They can open you up and dump everything in and you figure it out. And so lectures were pretty much, you were bombarded with a lot of information, very little application. So I'll give you an example. We have to learn nothing, a lot of chemistry. Every single year you're learning tons of chemistry in pharmacy school. And one of the things we have to learn that's very critical is what's called structural relationships of the modules. Well, I'm a very visual person, and someone lecturing to me about the structure is a, you know, it's a hexagon shaped, and off over here you've got the nitrogen, and off over here you've got uh, oxygen, it means nothing to me. And so early on in the classes, there were models that you could put together. Well, models only give you one particular level. Then you have to learn how to turn the thing around, and I couldn't visually do it. So that was just chemistry level classes, but other classes in pharmacy were very similar. What I learned is that the hands-on application was so critical to my learning, and I knew it had to be to others. When I became a professor, I said, everything I'm doing in the classroom, every concept that I cover, I'm gonna have to try to tie some kind of application to it so that those students who are in the classroom who are very visual like I am, they'll get it. Those who are very auditory will listen to my lecture and clearly understand, I thought clearly understand what was going on. And then you get those who, you know, that, as they say, that's the, they're kind of kinesthetic types. The hands-on thing with doing things in teams, I felt would help them, you know. So I felt like using that kind of background that I had had 
lecture was not going to be enough. So try to make this blend of learning experiences. So when I have a class full of, of 100, at least I'm trying to tap into what everyone can, can, can be familiar with. The one thing I would say to incoming students about any curriculum, whether it's a easy curriculum or a very, very complex one, is you've got to ask questions. You have to begin to get to a point where you feel comfortable enough to know what you don't know and who to ask. So it doesn't mean asking someone else who has no clue like you do. That's easy to do, you know, ask another person who's, who's, who's unsure. But you've got to get to where you're comfortable about asking people like upperclassmen, or better yet, how about the instructor themselves? And really going in, talking to the instructor, saying, this is what I'm not clear upon. Mm -hmm.